and no one else has to scoot and ski daddle there. <laughs> All right, we're just basically going to look at two verses this morning from Hebrews 4, Hebrews 12, 4, 12, and 13. I'm going to start in verse 11, read 11, 12, and 13. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from the sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Thus is the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Almighty God in heaven, this word that we have just read about is mighty and powerful. We ask this morning that it would strike deep within our hearts, help us to know how we should act and think differently based upon what we hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I had a friend in high school, I won't mention his name in case he watches this sermon and <laughs> wonders why, okay, but he was always talking about the great things he could do, okay, so he's like, well, I've got this uncle, he's got this cabin up on the lake, you know, and one weekend we'll head up there, you know, and he says, it's just ours, right, free, we can go stay up there the whole weekend. Okay, cool, cool, you know, a few weeks pass. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm talking to my uncle, my uncle, yeah, we're talking about that cabin up there on the lake, you know, and we're going to get up there, we're going to get up there, I promise you. Week pass. And nothing never happens. It never happens. I'm like, what happened to the cabin? Well, you know, I don't know what happened. I talked to my uncle. Did he even have an uncle? Probably not. Did he even have a cabin? Probably not. Okay? And you had, you had guys like this in sports, too. So you guys have played sports. You know this. You can be out talking to somebody at school or something like that. And, man, I can shoot like nobody else. I am just, I can, I can shoot the rock. I can shoot the ball. You want to play? You want to play? So we go down to the gym. You're like, okay, great. This guy, this guy can shoot the ball. He's on my team. You know, a picking team. And he, and he can't hit anything. He misses everything. You're like, I picked you. I counted on your boasting to be accurate and true. Okay? And we all know people like this who boast of what they will or can do, but when the moment comes, they don't do it. They don't do it. And this is really what this passage, starting in chapter 3, verse 1, on to chapter 4, verse 13, is telling us. At the beginning, remember it said in chapter 3, verse 1, it talked about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Our confession. We have confessed Jesus. And the author is saying, okay, you've made this boast. You've said you've got this cabin up on the lake. You said you could shoot the rock. You said you love Jesus. Okay? Well, now comes the point in time where you get to prove it. Are you going to go back to Judaism? Are you going to go back... Or are you going to press forward? Are you going to go into the promised land or are you going to die in the wilderness? This is the moment of truth for this congregation. And that is why we have verses 12 and 13. Now we know verses 12 and 13, all of us, a lot of you probably haven't memorized verses 12 and 13. Maybe if you didn't, didn't even try, you just heard it so much. Okay? But why is it here? What is the point about the word of God in this passage? Okay, it's a great passage about the verse about the word of God. But why does the author put it here? Because he wants us to understand that the word of God exposes us. The word of God strips us bare. It says, okay, now's your chance. See, God said, God promised, there's some milk and honey there. And I'm going to bring you to the land, and I promise you, you will conquer. And they said, we believe. Coming out of Egypt, you know, the plagues, all that. Yes, we believe, we believe, we believe. All across the wilderness, they're trekking. We believe, we believe, we believe, we believe. Yes, we will do it. And then they get there, okay? They get there, and they shrink back. Their confession was false. And this is what God's Word does. God's Word exposes us. God's Word says, here comes the moment where you get to decide, where you get to show whether you're really on board or not. Okay? And that's why this passage is here that's why these verses are here. So don't rip 12 and 13 out of context. Don't, it is a great passage about the power of the, God's word, but it's got a specific point in this passage. Okay, Specific point. Okay, so there's two basic, basic, basic ideas here. Verse 12, the word, of, the word cuts to the bone. That's the way I'm going to phrase it. We'll talk about what that means. The word cuts to the bone. And then verse 13, God sees all the way in. Okay, So you can get the idea here that God is trying to give us, the, trying to help us understand nothing is left that God cannot see. Nothing is there that God cannot expose. Okay? Doesn't matter what it is. 
So the word cuts all the way to the bone, cuts all the way in, and then the second main point is God sees all the way in. Okay, so let's first talk about the word of God, and then we'll get to the eyes of God, if you want to think about it that way. The word of God and the eyes of God. Okay, so the author says, first remember, he's, he's encouraging them, strive, be diligent into that rest. I like to say it this way, spare no effort. Okay, spare no effort to enter that rest. Do everything you can to enter that rest, lest you fall. Do the same example. In other words, you can die in the wilderness. Okay, this is something the author keeps hitting. You can die in the wilderness. You are not special. You are not unique. You're not different from those people. You can die there. Okay? And then he goes to the Word of God. At first it says the Word of God is living. Okay? The Word of God is living. And this is what separates God's Word from every other book. Okay? Every other book. Let's just take this book right now. Okay? I know there's some Psalms in here, but just ignore that for a moment. Okay? All right. So this is a book written by men. Okay? It's a book by men written by men. Okay? It can, it can be fallible. There can be lines in here that are wrong. There can be things in here that are false. Even if there aren't things that are false, it is still a, war, war, a book written by men. Okay? Well, this is a book written by men as well. Okay? But not just by men. Okay? And this is the answer to the question, well, how can it be the infallible word of God when it's written by men? Well, because it wasn't just written by men. It was written by God. And that is why it is a lie. The Holy Spirit, Spirit is intimately connected to this word. Okay? And we see this just, let me give you just a couple of examples here. Um, Romans 15, verse 4. Okay, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Because that's just talking about the power of the scriptures and how the Spirit used them. But let's go to uh, 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. So you guys are probably pretty familiar with this phrase. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And most of you know this, it means breathed out by God. The word of God is breathed out by God. It is spirit infused. Okay? That is why it is a lie. That is why it works. That is why we're going to see in a minute it's effective. Okay? It is not just the word of man. When you sit down in the morning with your cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is, when you sit down and you come to this word, it is alive like no other book. When we come in here and you hear the word preached, it is alive like no other book. It is nothing else compares to it. Okay? And I think the best example is, is 1 Peter. I love this phrase, and I, I thought of this passage, I thought about it a lot. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have been purified, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, okay? So you've been born again. Not of incorruptible, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God which lives and abides forever. The word of God causes you to be born again. And now this is kind of an amazing thing. This word, when this Holy Spirit is connected to it and when it's saving, it comes in and it changes your heart. Okay? It changes who you are. This word, when believed, can move you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Okay? In the blink of an eye. Man can read Romans. Augustine can pick up Romans, and he can read it. And all of a sudden, he's a different man. He's completely changed. The Word of God is living. It is alive because God is working in it and through it to save us and to sanctify us. Okay? So the Word of God is living right? because the Holy Spirit's connected to it. And it's important to understand, the Holy Spirit doesn't just float around and kind of randomly jump into people's lives. The Holy Spirit works through avenues, works through pipes, if you will. And those pipes, one of those pipes is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit comes through the Word of God. People will talk about the Holy Spirit coming and talking to them. Well, He doesn't. He doesn't talk to you. At least not, I'm looking at all sorts of, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail here. But He doesn't talk to you. Unless you're reading this. You know, Kevin Young liked to, liked to say, you know, if we want to know what God says, we want, the Holy Spirit, we want to know what the Holy Spirit is saying, go read the Bible. Okay? Go read the Bible. Right, so the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, this is his book, this is, he wrote it, he oversaw it, it is alive, all right? It is alive, okay? First thing. Second, the word of God is effective, and this is the best translation of this word. Some people say powerful, some translations say powerful, some translations say active, but the best translation of it is, it is effective. It does a work in your life. Okay, the word of God does this. Now, our immediately think, we immediately think here, well, I know lots of people who read the word. Lots of people hear the word preached, and it doesn't do them any good. 
Well, your assumption there is that the effectiveness of God's word is that it does good all the time. Well, no, it doesn't always do good. Sometimes God's word separates the sheep from the goats. Some guys, sometimes God's word separates the wheat from the tares, but it has been effective. It has still been effective. That is its goal, is to separate and to divide and to expose. And that's what it's there for, and it always accomplishes that. And again, I'm going to use passages that you guys are pretty familiar with here, but Isaiah 55 is the best one about this. Um, yeah, Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread of the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So the question isn't, is the word effective? It is always effective. The question is, what is the goal? And if you know anything about Isaiah, Isaiah was as much judgment as he was salvation. And the word of God in Isaiah wasn't just all good news. It was judgment too. And Paul says the same thing in Corinthians. He says the gospel preached is life to those who are being saved and death to those who are perishing. The word of God is always effective. It exposes folly. It exposes unbelief. And this is part of the point in the passage. Remember, they had God's word. They did not believe. And therefore, God's word exposed their unbelief. And this is part of what God's word does. God's word is not just there to pump us up. God's word is not just there to make us feel good. God's word is there to expose things. And if it exposed unbelief, it did its job. Okay? So the word of God is affected. It is powerful. It moves into our life. So it doesn't matter whether you feel lightning strike when you do your Bible reading. It doesn't matter whether you feel like this sermon is so dramatic and it changes your life. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. If it is the word, it is being affected. It is doing something in you. Okay? Doing something in you. Right. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Third, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay? Piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. The word there, piercing, is a great word. It penetrates in. That's the goal, the idea the author is trying to get. You penetrates in it goes deep and think about a sword okay a sword can cut your body and cut your heart but a sword can't get to your soul and this is why the word of god is sharper than the two-edged sword okay because you can die from a sword but the sword can't touch the inner man the sword can't touch your soul all right god's word can touch your soul it can reach all the way in all right and pierce and we've we've been there at times in our lives I think all of us have. Probably wish we'd been there more sometimes. But God's word, we're sitting there, we're reading, or we hear a sermon. I remember a couple in college and some since then that I've listened to. And man, it just feels like there's just knife going. Not to your heart. Not to your physical heart, but to your soul. It's like something's happening to me. The word is like in there ripping me to pieces. You know, tearing me apart. You know? And that's what the word of God does. And again, the power of the word here. The power of the word. You know, parents, we, we spank and we should, but that spanking cannot reach the inner man like the word can. Okay, the word of God is powerful and mighty. Okay, and then the last thing, the fourth thing about the word of God is it is a discerner. Or it is a, the word used here it has judge in it. You could translate this, the word of God is skilled in judging the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we all, all we can do, you know, God says about David, man looks on the outward. That's all we can do. I can't see your heart. You can't see my heart. I can't see what's bouncing around in your head. Your spouse who loves you and is closer to you than anybody else can't see what's bouncing around in your head or in your heart, you know. But God's word can. It can judge. It can go all the way in there and see exactly what is happening in our hearts. And notice here, the thoughts and intents of the heart matter. Not just the action. Remember, Israel did all the right things in one sense. Okay, and we'll talk about this in a minute. But Israel came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They went through the wilderness. They went up to Mount Sinai. Remember Mount Sinai? They renewed the covenant. And they said, yes, Lord, we will follow you. Okay? And then they trekked back across the wilderness and came to the edge of promise. And they'd done all the right things. But their hearts were not believing. Okay? And the word of God punched in there and judged the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay? 
So the Word of God is living because it's connected to the Holy Spirit. And this is also why it's effective. Because the Holy Spirit reaches in and pierces to the innermost man. The innermost man. Understand here the power of God's Word. Understand the power of God's Word in this passage. The Word of God does what nothing else, no other book can do. Nothing. Nothing. There is no book like it. And this is why we read it. This is why we study it. This is why you show up here on Sunday morning here at preach. This is why you teach it to your children. Because there is no book like the Word of God. There is no book that has the Spirit connected to it. There is no book where you can go and say, this is surely and completely God's Word. Guaranteed, every word of it. You can trust it, you can believe it, you can study it, you can learn it, you can know God through it. But, that's not the main point of the passage. The main point of the passage is the word exposes. The word opens us up. The word strips us down and exposes us. Verse 13. So first thing is the word cuts to the bone. The word digs all the way in. Okay. And then verse 13. God sees all the way in. Okay. And this is kind of almost like a, a two sides of the same coin here. Okay. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And the picture here is naked and open. That picture is someone laying on a table with their neck exposed. Think of someone about, or even kneeling with their head tilted back and a knife at their throat. That's how it was used in Greek literature. Okay? In other words, someone who's completely helpless, cannot defend themselves, totally at the mercy of the person there. That's the picture. That's how we are before God. You know, it's not intended to scare us. When we get to chapter, verse 14 and we see this high priest Jesus. But it is a little bit intended to scare us. Okay, It's not intended for us just to glide over and be like, well, it's no big deal. No, the point is we will be accountable to God. We will be accountable to God. And one of the things you see as you read, especially in the Psalms, but throughout the Bible, is wicked men, not just wicked men out there, but wicked men in the body of Christ, in the church, in the covenant, one of their problems is they believe they will not be held accountable by God. And uh, Joe read uh, Psalm 10. And Psalm 10 starts talking about the wicked. He boasts in his heart's desire. He's greedy. He renounces the Lord. It goes on. It says, God is in none of his thoughts. He doesn't think about God. Okay? Psalm 10, verse 8. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws them into his net. So he crouches, he lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. Okay, so he's sitting there. Picture a lion. You know, you guys all watch these National Geographic documentaries. You know, the lion's in the weeds. Boom! Jumps up, catches him. But then listen to this. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Okay. One of the roots of our sin is that we do not believe God sees us. We do not believe God knows what is going on in our hearts and our minds, especially our hearts and minds. Now, our actions, because they're open to men, we're a little more careful about that, aren't we? We don't want people to see us getting angry. We don't want people to see this or see that. So we're a little more careful about our actions, but the Word of God exposes the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not just what you do, but it's going inside. What's happening in here and in here? And God sees that. God knows that. Okay? And then it goes on to say, Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, You will not require an account. Okay, you will not require an account. Now read that. We think of the final judgment. Okay, which I think is in view here. It's talking about the final judgment. But remember, the illustration is Israel refusing to enter the promised land. The illustration is some final judgment, although that is there. The point is, in time in history, God will call you to account. He will, there will come a place in time where you will be at a border and God will say, obey me and go in. And, he will, and you will have a choice right then. He will call you to account. Okay? Almost like if I had my friend there. You know, and I said, okay, well, let's call your uncle and let's go up to the cabin this weekend. You know? Well, I don't want, no, no, let's call your uncle and go up to the cabin this weekend. I want to see this cabin. This sounds awesome. Let's go do this. Well, you know, uh, well, I don't know if he's right. Well, let's call him. And then you find out he's lying. I've called him to account. I've called him to account. And God is not just going to do that at the end of time. 
He's going to do that in history as well. There are going to be points in time. We're going to be moving along, moving along, moving along. And all of a sudden, the word of God is going to say, okay, I want you to do this. And you're going to be like, well, I don't know. God's calling you to account. He's saying, okay, are you going to obey me? Are you going to do what I've called you to do here? Are you going to sacrifice your reputation to follow me? Are you going to sacrifice your job to follow me? Are you going to love your wife enough to do this for her? Are you going to follow your husband enough to do this for him? There is going to be a point in time where God is going to say, okay, all those words you have said, all those times you have told me, and you have stood up and you have said, I believe, I believe, I believe, well, now it comes down to it. Now the point is here. Show me you believe. And that's what this means by calling to account. It doesn't just mean the end of history. It means in time, in space, and in history. Okay? So God sees all the way in. There's other Psalm 64, 5, Psalm 73, 11, Psalm 94. All of the, in the Psalms in particular, the wicked, one of the signs of a wicked man, is he does not believe God will call him to account. Okay? And the author is saying here in Hebrews, we're not just talking about the end times. We're talking about time, in history, in space. So, faith says God sees all the way in. Unbelief says only what I can see matters or only what other people can see matters. Belief says God sees all the way in. I want to be clean all the way in, all the way down, all the way to the bottom. So the word cuts to the bone. The word is powerful. It's alive. It's effective. It's a discerner. It's sharper. It pierces all the way into our souls. It moves us in ways nothing else can or do. We can be born again through that word. And then God sees all the way in. I mean, for most of us, this is just this is something we just need to remember in our daily lives, you know, that God will hold us to account when he sees all the way in. Okay, let me give a few applications here. A few applications from this passage. First of all, superficial Christianity is deadly. Okay? And that's what you have with the wilderness generation. Okay? They were doing all the right things. I mean, they, they, were, they were marching. They were heading to the promised land. They, they raised their fist and said, yes, yes, Mount Sinai. They were ready to do what's right. But in here, they were not. In here, unbelief set there. And it set there. And it set there. And eventually God exposed them and called them to account. Remember, the author says, with whom was he angry? Uh, back in chapter 3 there. For who having heard rebelled, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Chapter 3, verse 16. This is amazing. These are the guys who came out of Egypt. These are the people who were led by Moses, and they still died. Why? Because they did not believe. Okay? And we live in an age of absolutely superficial Christianity. Okay, And I don't mean, again, not those out there. Us in here are exposed to it and tempted to it as well. A Christianity that is only skin deep. A Christianity that doesn't want to suffer, that doesn't want to pay the price, that doesn't want to do the hard thing, that's the kind of Christianity. We live in a nation where that is the type of Christianity that's around you. You have drunk that in. You have soaked that in, whether you want to or not. Okay? And it is deadly. And a superficial Christianity doesn't ask the why, doesn't ask what's going on in your heart. A superficial Christianity says all that matters is what people can see. And as long as I look good out here, I'm fine. As long as I look like I'm marching towards the promised land, I'm fine. It doesn't matter whether unbelief is there or not. So my encouragement to you, based on this, is ask what's going on inside. What is happening in your heart? Why do you do the things you do? Ask the Lord to expose that. Okay? Don't just ask what you do. Ask the why. Why are you doing that thing? What motivates you? What drives you? Are you believing the word of God here or not? Is God's word taking your heart and reshaping it, taking your thoughts and reshaping it? Or is the word of God something that's just boom, boom, bouncing off? You know, yeah, yeah, I hear it, I hear it, I hear it, but I'm just going to keep up this little facade. It's a little sort of pretend Christianity. That's exactly what the Israelites did, a pretend Christianity. Okay. Second, God's word is there to expose our true selves. That is what God's word is there to do. All right, that is its job. Okay. It, is, it is in a sense like the guy who goes along and kicks over the rocks. What's underneath those rocks? What's underneath our hearts? That's what God's word does. God's word is not here to make you feel good. This is not a therapy session okay, where you're supposed to leave with higher self-esteem. Or you're supposed to feel better about yourself when you're all done. The question is you're supposed to see yourself rightly. 
That's the goal of the Word of God. It's so that you can see yourself rightly. All right? It doesn't always mean the outcome is good. Okay? A lot of times when our true selves are exposed, it's an ugly picture. Kind of like peeling away. We replaced the bathtub this week. And you know, you, you dig up, you get the tub out, and you start peeling back the vinyl, you know. And guess what you find underneath there? Well, wood. It's not nice, clean wood. It's wood that water's been there. And it's kind of squishy and soft. And you're like, oh, that's got to be dealt with. Well, a lot of times that's what it's like. God's word comes in there, gets out the crowbar, peels back our superficial vinyl and says, okay, what's underneath there? Well, it's ugly. Okay, we need to deal with that. That's what God's word is there to do. I think for a lot of us, God's word, we view it as something that's there to massage us, comfort us. And it does, and we'll get to that in a minute. It does comfort us. Okay? But it only comforts us when we see ourselves as we actually are. Not as we are in our head, not as people think we are, but as we actually are. Okay? And brothers and sisters, that's what the word is there to do. Okay? And if you don't like that, then find a different word. Because there's places you can go, clubs you can join, things you can do where they'll talk nice to you and you can all be friends and no one's going to ask you what's going on in your heart. It's fine. Well, that's not this club. Okay? Christianity isn't about that. Okay? So second, God's word is there to expose our true selves. Third, your belief in God's word is tested when obedience is required and you don't want to do it. There will come a point in time where you are going to be called into account. Where God is going to say to you, okay, I want you to do this for me. I've been letting you skate by. It's been kind of easy. You've been reading the more. You've been showing up at worship. You've been tithing. You've been doing all these right things. Well, now comes the hard point. Are you going to cross over or are you going to shrink back? And that time will come in your life. Okay? A time will come in your life. It may be, and the world may not know. It may be something that's even in your own home, in your own heart. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be something huge in public. It just means the time will come where you are standing there. And God will say, believe my word. He'll say, it doesn't make any sense, God. Imagine what could happen if I do that. And God will say, I want you to do that. My word says do it. Do it. That time will come. And if you have spent your life putting up a facade, then you will crumble. I'm just telling you, that's what will happen. You will be like the friend of mine who had no cabin in the woods, okay? Who had no uncle. He ran away. You know, you run, you leave. You don't want to talk to somebody anymore. You want to be done with it. You will crumble. And like Israel, you will fall in the wilderness. Okay? There will be, I think this is a great way to describe it, there will be a wilderness moment for you. Maybe several moments. I mean, come can come lots of time. But there will be a moment, a wilderness moment for you, where God will say, cross over and you will see the giants, and you will see the trouble, and you will see the problems, and God will say, cross over anyway. And we've got to be ready and believe God's word enough to do that. Now, the simple way to do this, brothers and sisters, is just obey day in and day out. I was telling the kids this morning at breakfast, just obey day in and day out. When those, there's big things that are hard, but there's also all sorts of little obediences. If you're faithful in those little obediences, if you when something as little as like, I'm not going to get upset about that. I know I, I want to, but I'm going to keep my emotions in check. I'm not going to get angry about that because God's word tells me not to get angry about that. So I'm going to work on that. Just something a little like that. You know, just, just little things in your day-to-day -day life. Okay? I don't want to follow my husband there. I don't, want to, I don't want to do what he says. But Lord, this isn't a sin, and you tell me to be, be like my, my mother Sarah. I'm going to follow her, and I'm going to obey my husband and, and submit to him in this point. Those little obediences day in and day out are what ultimately prepare, prepare you for that moment when the big obedience is there. Okay? But day in and day out, you're just compromising. You're kind of putting up this, this pretend front, you know, pretending that you're faithful, but the reality is you're compromising left and right. Then when that wilderness moment comes, you will crash and burn. Okay? Crash and burn. All right. Superficial Christianity is deadly. God's word is there to expose our true selves. Your belief in God's word will, is tested when obedience is required, and it will be. And the fourth thing is remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. And this is verses 14, and we're going to get all into this. Okay? The author didn't bring us here to destroy us. The author didn't tell us God's word cuts to the bone, we're exposed, we're naked and open, so he can smash us to pieces. He brought us here so we would come to Jesus. And that's the point of chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is glorious. Jesus is great. He is the promised land. He is the rest. He is the one that forgives. He is the one that can heal us. He is the one that can rescue us. Flee to Jesus. Okay? Let God's word expose your true self. 
Let God's word pull up that vinyl and it'll be ugly. And then say, Jesus, deal with this. Deal with this and confess your sins to Jesus. Okay. So verses 12 and 13 don't mention Jesus a lot. But you get to verse 14, he does. And we're talking about that next week. Jesus is glorious. So a lot of us, we all have sins in our hearts. Bitterness, anger, lust, malice, hatred, whatever. We have those things in our hearts and in our heads. And when God exposes that, it can be terrifying and horrible for us. We can hate ourselves for it. But that's not what the author wants us to do. The author wants us to flee to Christ. So I encourage you, let God's word expose your true self and then go to Jesus. And say, Jesus, here is who I am. I am ugly. I am dirty. I am unclean. Heal me. Cleanse me. Take away my sins. That's the goal. That's the goal. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. As we look at this, uh, verses 12 and 13, in a lot of ways our hearts are race. As we read this, the idea of being naked and open before you, the idea of being exposed, the idea of our necks being bent back, the idea that your word cuts all the way into those parts that nobody else ever knows or sees or hears about, those things in our heads and our hearts, Lord, that are painful and sinful. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you that you don't let us sit there and um, imagine who we are, but you show us who we actually are. We ask, Father in heaven, that you would continue through your word as we read it throughout the week, as we do it in family worship, as we're here preached, Lord. Help your word to penetrate, to cut us open, to show us who we really are, and then help us not to despair, but instead help us to look to the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, and how mighty and great his forgiveness is and his work is, that even us, who are so dirty and so unclean, can be forgiven and cleansed because of his blood. We pray all this in his strong name. Amen.